From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo, and I'm here with my colleagues, Kyle Peterson and Bill McGurn. And Donald Trump spoke to the Conservative Political Action Committee event on Saturday evening. For him, he gave something of a disciplined speech with a prompter and a few side riffs, and it was focused on Biden and the future more than on the grievances about the 2020 election, which, of course, have preoccupied him for more than two years now. So that was a different angle on the speech. But Donald Trump clearly has Ron DeSantis on his mind. Let's listen to an excerpt. We're not going back to people that want to destroy our great social security system even some in our own party. I wonder who that might be. (laughs) They want to raise the minimum age of Social Security to 70, 75, or even 80 in some cases. And that are out to cut Medicare to a level that it will no longer be recognizable. And when that was their original thought, that's what they always come back to. Remember that. You have to remember that. You heard it here first. With Donald Trump, you always heard it there first. This is a not-so-subtle jibe at Ron DeSantis, who, when he was a House member, voted a couple of times for Paul Ryan's budgets. That did indeed pass the House. Those budgets had Medicare reform, had modest Social Security reform, and Trump thinks this is a vulnerability for DeSantis and is going to go after him for that. Uh, Just a couple of factual points, Bill. I mean, it's pure demagoguery. There's nobody I know is raising a retirement age to 80 or uh, or even 75. It's now, uh, of course, uh, 67. When Social Security was founded, the average life expectancy was 65. So they set a retirement age of 65. Now the average life expectancy is far greater than that. And we're still at only 67 for retirement age. So it's hardly outrageous to say we should raise retirement age, especially since Social Security's funds are approaching insolvency. As for Medicare cuts, he sounds like Joe Biden demagoguing any change to Medicare. But what do you make of this looming attack from Trump on DeSantis on those two programs and how they'll play? Well, Paul, first, I always have a sort of affection for CPAC because 30 years ago, I met my wife there. So unlike Humphrey Bogart, I always tell her we'll always have CPAC. It doesn't go over. <laughs> doesn't go You're over. You're such a romantic, Bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you think DeSantis needs a personality, uh, maybe uh, I do too. But that's, that said, I think the there's two points about uh, President Trump. I think one, it shows he hasn't found an attack that sticks to DeSantis. He's always attacking DeSantis, coming up with nicknames that haven't really stuck. He's floundering a bit. And DeSantis has handled that very well, not really mentioning him, but putting his digs in, pointing out the differences. And I think Trump is looking for an opening, something to exploit. And as you say, I think it's an odd Republican banner to say we're not going to touch Social Security or Medicare and let it just go belly up as it's heading right now. So I don't think that will work too much. But it does point to a bigger problem, I think, in this race, if you look at it as DeSantis and Trump. Trump has a clear advantage. One, he has a lot of support in the party. But bigger, the implicit threat of Trump is that if he loses the nomination, he'll go off and start a third party. Or he won't go off, but he'll attack the GOP nominee. And that could siphon off just enough votes to deny DeSantis a victory. So Ron DeSantis always has a balancing act. He has to attack Trump, but not in a way that will really alienate his supporters, because the implicit threat is if Donald Trump is the nominee, he's going to blow it all up. So I think that's a hard part, but I think it does point to he's having a hard time coming up with a line of attack that's effective. DeSantis, you know, has a lot going for him, including that he won a second term for election. And he's reminded the president of that a few times. We're going to see where it goes from here. Yeah, I think the line that Trump is a loser, having lost in 2020, 
And uh, indeed, uh, Republicans having performed poorly in every election since 2016, really, it's going to be a message that uh, DeSantis, and not just DeSantis, but the other Republicans will use against Trump. The other thing that's striking, Kyle, about the Trump speech is that he is taking, if you can believe it, he's escalating the attack on others in his own party. It's clearly, I mean, he attacked the, he said, we're going to clean out, get rid of the Bushies, the, the globalists the neocons, the warmongers, and other folks in the party. That's obviously, he's basically trying to cast out a significant portion of the party and obviously have to draw distinctions in a primary race. But if you're a former president who lost re-election because a substantial number of Republicans who voted for other Republicans for Senate and the House couldn't vote for you, which is what happened in Georgia and Arizona and uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, then casting them out into outer darkness may not be a winning platform come November 2024. Right. It's the opposite of what we were talking about earlier, a sunny morning in America message that aims to be a big tent and to bring in voters who are not traditionally Republican voters the way that they still talk about Reagan Democrats as influencing politics of that decade. That is what Glenn Youngkin could maybe pull off. That is maybe what Ron DeSantis could pull off. And with Trump, it seems like we're back to American carnage. He was telling the CPAC audience, I am your retribution. And so it strikes me as a kind of classic Trump Republican grievance politics. And then layered on top of that is his classic over-promising of all sorts of stuff that some of it is hard to even understand what he means by it. He's talking about how he can end the Ukraine war in one day. He is talking about adding universal baseline tariffs onto most products. I think the debate over the tariffs that President Trump put in place while in office has been pretty far settled to the argument that it didn't really work. It didn't accomplish what he intended. It didn't shift China's trajectory very much, and it cost Americans a lot, including farmers who then were bailed out on the back end. And then he's talking about stuff like building new 10 freedom cities on federal land to reignite the American imagination, reopen the frontier. I mean, it seems to me that this is the the classic Trumpian stew of anger and resentment and big promises that look like they would be difficult for him to get enacted the way that we're still waiting on the border wall and waiting on Mexico to pay for it. And yet, as listeners will let me know after this podcast, Donald Trump still leads in the primary national polling, if anything, in the last couple of weeks since the East Palestine train derailment where he showed up, Joe Biden didn't. He's uh, picked up a little bit in the in the national polling. Now, my own view is that polls at this stage of the race are hardly definitive. There's just a snapshot now, uh, partly name recognition, partly folks based on uh, what they know of Trump from his presidency. But that can change enormously once people see how candidates perform on the stump. As you know, uh, Bill, there was a very famous uh, Democratic leader in the polls by the name of Hillary Clinton <laughs> in 2008. Everybody thought it was a shoe in and she didn't get the nomination. So a lot can change, but Trump does have a lot of residual support within the party. And I think it's a mistake for anybody to say that somehow he could not get the nomination. Yeah, I think that's a mistake, though I don't think it's as strong as it may look. I mean, the campaign hasn't really begun. Ron DeSantis hasn't announced. So it's amazing how far DeSantis has come to me without actually running. You know, now he's just this weekend given a couple of speeches, but we haven't got that much from him. It's going to pick up when they have to choose. It'll be interesting. I personally think the real threat to the Republican Party of victory in 2024 is not Donald Trump winning the nomination, but losing the nomination and then doing what he can to sabotage whoever the nominee is, especially if it's Ron DeSantis. So that's what I worry. I think DeSantis has two challenges to win the nomination and to do it in a way that doesn't make Donald Trump or his supporters walk away from him. Because as you say, they're a significant chunk of the party. And all the while, what as Donald Trump will unleash hell, to borrow a phrase from the movie Gladiator, on Ron DeSantis in order to try to destroy him so he can get the nomination. I think your scenario, Bill, lays out, uh, I think, what is a net plus 
for the Democrats, no matter who they nominate in 2024. Of course, there's a long way to go. A lot of time left to talk about both of those candidates and many others as the campaign year moves ahead. Thanks to Kyle. Thanks to Bill. Thank you all for listening. (music) 